ان الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلله فلا هادي له ونشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له ونشهد ان محمدا عبد الله ورسوله صلى الله عليه وسلم اما بعد فان اصدق الحديث كتاب الله وخير الهدي هدي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وشر الامور محدثاتها وكل محدثه بدعه وكل بدعه ضلاله وكل ضلاله في النار اما بعد اوصيكم ونفسي بتقوى الله عز وجل my dear brothers and sisters we begin our lives we begin our days we begin our sermon with an abundant praise of our beloved creator who has provided us with our lives this gift of life and we hope to live a life that shows gratitude and reflection so as a muslim as a submitter to divine will we have to be focused on that because we're surrounded by an environmental worldly materialistic influence that would have us lean towards the call of shaitan so in today's sermon, uh, we want to talk about something that can give us some uh, perspective in dealing with the summer that's coming up now. We're right here on the cusp of summer and moving forward, we need to establish some prioritized uh, strategy about how to deal with the summer. Obviously, many people have uh, kids that will now not be in school. Many people go on vacations and uh, so forth. So obviously throughout the school year, as good Muslim parents and good Muslim youth, uh, we made academic excellence a priority. And that is definitely a great priority. We should seek uh, worldly excellence to do something good for the world and to seek means so that we can provide for ourselves and our families in the future. Uh, but what we want to do is not just to stop there and then think as many of our youth think that the summer is just three months of playing and doing nothing and sleeping all day playing video games watching television surfing on the internet until we fall over asleep this is not um, what a Muslim should be doing with their lives so what we want to do is seek that eternal success so going to a school and seeking good grades and working hard for that is a worldly success, okay? But we will all die at some point. That's a fact. The question is, what's going to happen, happen after that? So I'm sure many of you were very excited either to graduate or to see your kids graduate or to walk across and take that diploma and the camera flashes and all of the mashallah Allah, Allah, clapping and praising and all that that's great and then for many of you when you got that first job and you got that first paycheck you bought that house you're very happy right you're very happy it's natural this is this is part of the reality of the world but unfortunately that is what we're told is the point of life these things these worldly material means but what would happen if you went through life and you graduated and you got A's and you went and you got your diploma and you got a high status and you became a person with a great job and you got a high income and a great paycheck and then you die and then you're resurrected and then your book of deeds comes to your left hand or behind your back and you feel this huge burden of the heedlessness of the ultimate absolute reality in which you were living the responsibility for knowing spiritual focus so there's a poem that uh, one of the great uh, arabic poets made about this point and i think it's something that we should relate to ourselves in our uh, in our kids lives so he says, بَصُرْتُ بِالْرَاحَةِ الْكُبْرَى فَلَمْ أَرَحَا تُنَالُ إِلَّا عَلَى جِسْرٍ مِنَ التَّعِبِ فَقُلْ لِمَرَجِّ مَعَالِ الْأُمُورِ بِغَيْرِ اجْتِحَادٍ رَجَوْتَ الْمُحَالَةِ أَحْزَانُ قَلْبِ لَا تَزُولُ حَتَّى أُبَشَّرَ بِالْقَبُولِ وَتُسَرُّ عَيْنِي بِالرَّسُولِ صلى الله عليه وسلم. So, 
the, uh, the poet, he said what means, I took a deep look into the great rest. And what he's talking about is when you have earned the right to just rest. What many people this think this summer is, right? There is a time, it's in Jannah, right? So this poet is talking about what, what he's seen through his spiritual focus and looking into Islam and the reality of life. And so he says, I looked into the big uh, rest and I did not find it except after going over a bridge of uh, toiling and difficulty and hardship. That's the reality. Okay, so then he says, tell the one who desires the noble heights of greatness without hard work that you are desiring something impossible. He says, the sorrows of my heart are not going to go away until I have the acceptance of God entering heaven. And I see, I have saw that book come down in my right hand and then I'm delighted with the sight of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. That's, so that's, the, that's what we call ulu al himma That is a high focused concern about my spiritual reality, which is eternal, right? We're being conditioned to believe that that's a secondary small compartment of your culture. You go to a religious service every week and you've done your job. When the Prophet Sallallahu and his companions, who are great examples, they actually took it very seriously and daily with wives and families and children and businesses and jobs at the same time they were very much adamant about their focus on spirituality the remembrance of god the enjoining of right and forbidding of wrong the concern for the well-being of their family and the society around them by an activist approach and they were very much serious about that while they were serious with what people would call the secular life. But there was no such thing as a secular life to them. It was just all functioning under the guidance of Islam. Everything that they did. It was a comprehensive system of life. So in identifying our priorities, I'd like to reflect on Surat Luqman. Um, this is a chapter that's uh, got some very powerful, beautiful meanings packed into about four pages. And one of the most important parts of that is a discussion between Luqman the wise and his son. And so it's, a teach, it's teaching us about the priorities of focus in strategizing a good, decent relationship between parents and children. And so in the beginning of that, it says, وَلَقَدْ أَتَيْنَا لُقُمَانَ الْحِكْمَةِ What is the hikmah? أَنِشْكُرْ لِلَّهِ the beginning of it is, it says that we have given this Luqman, some scholars said he's a prophet, some scholars said there's no actual proof of that, but at any rate, he was a blessed person that divine wisdom was given to him, as was given to many people who weren't prophets in the history of mankind. And so what was the wisdom that Luqman was given? It is gratitude to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that was, a, that was the priority. In this discussion, the first thing that defined a proper relationship between a parent and a child is teaching them to be grateful to God for everything that they have and to relate things to the fact that this is the rizq, this is the sustenance, these are the blessings of God. If you're going to eat, we, there should never be a time that a family ate unless they were remembering uh, Allahumma barik lana fihi wa at'amna khayran minhu some of you might say I never heard that one well that's actually an authentic hadith the Allahumma barik lana fi ma razaqtana wa qina adab al nar believe it or not is a weak hadith either way it's fine if you want to do either one but as Muslims we should strive to learn in our religion and to grow past just accepting things that we heard when maybe there's a more authentic more established way of doing things as a Muslim. So we should be teaching this gratitude. Uh, taking kids, say we went to a vacation, for example, right? And they see something at a museum, or they see the creation of God, like we're going through the mountains of the Smoky Mountains. We need to sit and talk. Do you see this beautiful, powerful creation? All this multifaceted colors and this beautiful symbiotic relationship of the environment and how it all works together. We need to have this regular discussion with our kids about the divine presence in His creation. 
and all of the blessings that we all have, that everything that we have is a blessing from Him. And that He's the one that establishes the steps and the phases in our life that facilitate for us the means of attaining everything that we have. And that if we became intelligent enough to get a degree or we got a, a good grade, then all of the praise is to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We need to have this relationship so that we can balance out that constant secular individualistic me, mine and what I have done and what I earn and what is for me because of my doings that our society is so much pushing onto us. So I think uh, when you look at the relationship between Iman and Kufr, the scholars said that the word Kufr uh, in its basic essence is to try to conceal something that's known. And so with regard to faith, it's talking about trying to conceal or to not recognize the blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Kufranun ni'ma, right? So Iman is, uh, the faith is basically built on gratitude that I've been given life and I've been given so much by my Creator. And so I owe it to him to do whatever he wants me to do because he's the one that gave me my life and everything in it, right? So that relationship needs to be understood and also the relation, that's why he mentions about Darul Walidain, to have honor and respect for your parents because those people he chose to be special facilitators for his blessings to these children that are growing up. Right? So the parents need to remind uh, their kids that God is the one that is providing them with what they have and all the means that they've done to take care of them. But at the same time, they need to be reminding the kids that nobody's forcing me to do what I do for you. And if I would have left you as a small child and not done what I've done, you would have died. You would have not became anything. You would have been had the worst life possible if I did not take care of you. And so for our children, the little arrogant attitude that we find is really oftentimes because maybe we haven't really discussed in a very logical way what this is. Instead of it just being because I'm your parent, you must obey. That attitude is going to create a friction and a fear zone, right? But if while doing things, you're relating things to God, humbling yourself to who you uh, owe your respect to, and you teach them that, then inshallah, hopefully as well, that whenever you have your parents around, and when elders are around you, that you, that you bring that attitude, maybe they will see it better. And we hope and pray that our youth will recognize all of the blessings of their parents because that gratitude is, is going to establish the rights um, for God and for parents over their children. In discussing things with our kids, it's very important to remind them of spirituality. To talk to them in their own language. A lot of times what I've found happen, and I've talked to many youth growing up about this, a lot of times, it's one thing to teach your kids the family's cultural heritage of language and all that, that's great. This is a beautiful thing to learn many languages, we should. But if you're going to relate to them spiritually and you want them to really own it and see it as something that's theirs, kind of going back into our last two sermons, you have to talk to them in their language. And that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commanded us. And He said, وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَا مِنْ رَسُولٍ إِلَّا بِلِسَانِ قَوْمِهِ لِيُبَيِّنَ لَهُمْ Right? So, unfortunately, we want our kids to be from our qawm from another place, but they're from a qawm from here. And so we have to talk to them in the language that they understand best if we want spirituality to manifest. Because what I found is many parents get in, many kids get into this confirming with kind of a fake, superficial naam or acha, you know, just going along with whatever their parents say because they want them to be happy and make, they want them to think that they understand what they're talking about. But in many cases, they don't really get what's being said. Right? And so I think spirituality, it definitely according to the verse in Surah Ibrahim, it should be explained in a language that the youth can relate to and that they can relate to others with it. 
Because if their only reality of spirituality is something that is not something they can relate to and something they can explain to others here in America as people with a da'wah and a calling, then that is going to cut off a large part of our spiritual growth and development. So yes, teach them your language from your family and your heritage and everything, conversational language, teach them things, that's great. But let's make sure there's a reasonable amount of attention given to talking to them in a, uh, in a spiritual understanding that they can grasp in their own native tongue, which is English here. Um, that being said, some I've had some brothers and sisters come to me and say, okay, that's great advice, but I don't know how to say what I'm trying to say because I got the idea in my mind in the language I was raised in. So I just want to tell them and I don't want to, it just feels weird trying to talk to them in a language that I'm not comfortable with. Well, for that reason, it's a responsibility on any Muslim that goes to any corner of the earth to learn how that language, as a matter of fact, when the Prophet ﷺ went to, uh, when he was in Medina, okay, Zayd bin Thabit was a very intellectual person. And when they started making relations with the Jews and they wrote up the Treaty of Medina, the Prophet ﷺ told Zayd bin Thabit, go learn Hebrew, right? Go learn Hebrew. And it, the, one of the narrations, it seems ridiculous, but Wallah Alam. And he has said he learned it in two weeks. So he went and he soaked up Hebrew. He lived around, he talked to them, he kept talking and learning and taking notes and all of that, learning their script and everything, and he learned it. The purpose was to make da'wah, to be able to build those ties with those people. So definitely, we have a library that is very, very high quality. I don't want Satan to fool anybody to think, Alhamdulillah, I know everything about Islam. Because obviously, um, even the greatest scholar in the world would be very adamant about telling all of us that they have only begun to learn the beauty of the rich tradition of uh, the sciences of Islamic knowledge. So, I would encourage everybody here, right now we have about 30, 40 members of our library. If we want our library to grow and to be bigger and stronger, which right now it has all the high quality stuff, all of the best stuff that will help you to be able to grasp and, and, and process and explain concepts in the English language. Right? Because it's very difficult for the common person that just learn English just to work and to get around to become uh, master translators. It's very difficult, right? So this would help you if you read books by scholars who are native to this land that study the Islamic sciences and are from a scholarly basis bringing you this information into English. If you read those books, it would be, make you a very, very, very good da'i, caller to Islam for your children, for your neighbors, for your co-workers, and for everybody else. It will facilitate a way for you to get across this message that we're all ud'u ila sabili rabbika bil hikmah wal mu'adhat al hasana. The Quran is commanding, call to the way of your Lord with wisdom and good preaching. Wisdom would be to make sure that the, the message is getting across right. So obviously the first step would be to know the language. Mu'adhat al hasana, to know the best points and proofs to say in the right situation and to say them in a nice gentle respectful tone and not an antagonistic uh, tone. So that's very important. We should all be part of that. Keeping good companionship. Keeping good companionship is a very important reality. Follow the way of those who come to me, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us. Right? Follow those who are tied to a spiritual focus. So obviously a lot, many of our parents don't realize it's very tough and the struggles that our kids are going through with identity, being surrounded in a public school system, and uh, much even worse than that, having a close friend that's not Muslim and doesn't see Islamic values or even Christian values as anything on their priority list, right? If that's the case, as the Prophet ﷺ says, So we should definitely support, put our money, our kids, and our effort into making our school the Islamic school, the best possible school. And it is not from the Muslim character to say, oh, they're not doing this right, they're not doing that right, so I just give up and I quit and I'm not going to take part in it. No, that is, a, that is, a, that is a, a, a quitter mentality. If that was the mentality of the Prophet Wasallam, there would be none of us sitting here today as a result. So we should be people who work for what's in our best benefit. The reality is, some of us might not be able to afford the school system. Uh, so inshallah, if you are finding your kids, they're at the public school, obviously they're going to have non-Muslim friends. 
you should invite them to your house and you should have a hospitable loving compassionate understanding talk to them in their language learn their lingo learn what they're interested in and try to be with your kids and their friends someone that they can be like you know it's cool to hang out with so-and-so unfortunately some of the culture that we have is just those are kids but if you really want to be a da'i, if you want to build a relationship, if you want to affect your kids and their friends, become someone that they think is cool and fun to be around. They enjoy your presence. But that's balanced with a spiritual focus. So you're not like, you didn't pray. It's time to pray. So you'll be hanging out playing PlayStation with them or something. And then you're going to be like, actually right now we're going to stop just so we can pray and then we can come back. Right? If you have that attitude and you have that balance, they will respect you and they will see. But if you're strict and rigid and harsh and judgmental, nobody wants any part of that. Right? That's just a normal human inclination. We have to build uh, bridges. And so we have to uh, be aware of our kids' friends. Uh, I've talked to many parents who fell into a tough situation where got a lot of work, trying to make that money, the mother's doing whatever she's doing, and everybody's got responsibilities. And then they're like, but what happened to my kids? Well, whenever I talked with the kids, it turns out their close friends are people who are worshiping their desires. They just want to do what's fun and what suits my immediate gratification of desires. And in this society, there are many, many difficulties that you will face dealing with that, right? So I would say, know who your kids' friends are. Invite them to, prefer to have your friends, your kids' friends at your house, rather than them being at someone else's house. Very important point. I'm telling you right now, you don't know what's going on at so-and-so's house. Of course, you're, all kids are manipulators. They're master manipulators. Oh, cool shit, tamam, baba, alhamdulillah, there's no problem. We're cool. And then you find out they were, you know, doing something that is completely haram. And, or you didn't find out about it and some years went by, your kids have been completely conditioned outside of Islam and now we're in a big problem. Right? This is very important. But we don't want to do it in a harsh way. You cannot be like, you can't have them for friends, right? You, if you come, the balance, خير الأمور يأوسطها, right? The best uh, things are the balance, the middle road. كذلك جعلناكم أمة وسطا لتكونوا شهداء على الناس. So you have been made a balanced nation. If you take one extreme or the other, as the Prophet ﷺ said, هلك المتنطعون. The people who are extreme, they will be destroyed by themselves, by their own actions. If you take one extreme or the other. We have to be balanced and we have to understand where, as we were kind of talking about, where does Islam, where does the Quran and Sunnah put the red line? If there's things that are a matter of cultural comfort zones, let's relax here. Let's let people find their way here. But if it's something that is قطعيه الثبوت والدلاله على الحرمه والتحريم, then here's where we're going to make an issue. Somebody stop praying, somebody wants to go to a club or a party where there's drugs and alcohol. You know, the sister was trying to argue with me earlier. She said, you know, I think our kids should learn how to deal with prom. I'm sorry, I've come from this culture. I will tell you, there's one thing I'm sure about. Prom is not something you should allow your kids to be involved in. There's so many different uh, things that are not with our identity there. There's many things that we can do, right? But there's many things that we can't do and we have to strike that balance. So companionship is very, very important. We have to remind ourselves of the day of judgment. You know, it's, 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 it's very easy to get caught up in the daily life and not remember, I'm going to die. And I have a spiritual value. Just like we make money and we put it in the bank, there's hasanat in sayyat. There will be a day in which your spiritual value will be weighed. So we need to think to ourselves as parents, as children, we need to think. The things that I'm doing with my day, is there a bismillah? Is there an intention before that? Is there some value spiritually out of that? Is that most of my day I'm aware of my spiritual value? A lot of people just don't care about spiritual value. What's going to happen if you don't care about spiritual value? You're going to be bankrupt on the day when your soul will be judged based upon what you have chosen to do with your life. If you knew that you were always being videotaped, right? How would you live your life? It's a very different reality. And of course, we are all being videotaped by angels, kiram and katibin. They know what you're doing, they're writing it all down. Every single person has an account of deeds that nothing will be hidden on the day of judgment. 
So we need to be uh, talking about reinforcing the issue of reward and punishment as a divine absolute system of justice. When we're talking to our kids, we need to let them, and what's interesting is many kids, when you make rules, they don't like it. But what you need to take advantage of, when something they want someone else to do, you or others, doesn't go their way and they get upset, you need to ask them, oh, but I thought it's okay for us to just do whatever we want to do. And you know, you, you'll explain, you'll, you'll get to them that you see how you feel when you thought you had a reason to ask somebody else to do something and it didn't go your way and they didn't listen to you, right? Imagine God has given us our life and everything in it and we have all of these blessings that we are blessed with and then we choose to disobey Him. Imagine me who does everything I can to support you and take care of you and provide for you and you talk back to me and all of this, right? So. I think if we uh, understand the concept of reward and punishment system, I think we, we will do a lot. Um, establishing the, the prayers. Establishing the prayers. This is probably one of the things that our Ummah is most struggling with. And it is on the top. This is the, the most important pillar. I, I'm telling you, I promise you, I have talked with hundreds of kids that don't pray or that only pray obviously when somebody is trying to get them to pray and the problem is it was not made the uncompromisable structure of my day from the beginning right I can tell you that I know the vast majority of the youth are not praying the vast majority of them and when I talk to them it's a well insha'Allah no God has willed that you have to pray you're the one that chose not to pray that's your problem but it may be because when they were growing up there wasn't a strong sense of everybody wakes up for Fajr and everybody prays together and I've talked with many kids like I just don't understand the prayer I don't know what I'm saying they told me these Arabic things and it's just I don't even I don't get anything out of it there's no benefit I'm gaining from it right so we need to talk to our kids many of you might think well alhamdulillah we taught our kids the salah ask them about what this means and what that means and you will see very quickly why Ibn Abbas used to make this very common statement in teaching his students لَيْسَ لَكَ مِن صَلَاتِكَ إِلَّا مَا عَقَلْتَ مِنْهَا you will not get any reward out of your prayer except for what you understood and grasped in it so we need to make sure that our kids understand what prayer is and that it's the uncompromisable reality we have to make sure that if people are in our house and a prayer time comes that there's some adhan, there's some smartphone going off, everything shuts down. Everything stops and everybody gets to pray. No such thing. Whenever it says, وَأَقِيمُوا uh, salah and it says, وَرْكَعُوا uh, الرَّاكِعِينَ It's telling all of us that we're all obligated to pray in jama'ah. So if there's a jama'ah there, it is completely un-Islamic for somebody to say, Oh, well, I'm cooking right now, and so I'm not going to... Obviously, if the stove's going to burn everything up, that's one issue. But if it's a matter of, well, I can put that off for a minute just to go pray, that's what a Muslim is about. Prayer is the focus of our, that's the connection to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that we all have. Without it, we have disconnected ourselves from Him. And many people don't, don't understand the seriousness of this. Wallahi, uh, whenever I was a new Muslim, I didn't get it. Because it just seemed, you know, as an American, you think, oh, well, you can go to church sometimes, it's okay, you can do that. You know, this is the way we think, it's a very liberal attitude. There's no such thing as a set spiritual structure for your life. So if you're kind of lazy every now and then with it, your parents, your kids will follow your example and then we'll all be in trouble because the Prophet ﷺ said on the day of judgment the first thing you'll be judged by is your prayer if your prayers were all done to the best of your honest ability then all your deeds will follow suit the Prophet ﷺ says between a person in disbelief being not a Muslim anymore is leaving the prayer and believe it or not Ibn al-Mulaqin a great hadith scholar he's authenticated a hadith that says man Whoever left one prayer intentionally, knowingly, they just did not pray that prayer, that person is done with their Islam. Which is why the Hanabila, they made a very serious issue about someone who missed the prayer. Um, so we need to be very careful to see that missing a prayer is like having somebody amputate our arm off. It's something that we cannot accept. It's like having our eye poked out. It's like something that there is no compromise about. There should be a strong sense of understanding the prayer, discussing Surah Al-Fatiha, At-Tahiyyatu Lillahi wa Salawat, understanding these things, letting them pray, pour their hearts out in sujood, you know, encouraging that reality, I think we will get a lot of
of value uh, of that. And so finally is humility and good words. If we're going to establish a spiritual value, we have to be on the opposite side of Satan. A shaitan, he came with arrogance. His, the first divergence from Islam was, I'm better than Adam. I was created before him, I'm of a better nature, I'm smarter than him, I'm better than him. And so then the jealousy kicked in and I want to be the chosen one. So I'm going to prove to God that this Adam and his progeny will all follow me. I will show him that I'm superior, right? And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, no, except for the righteous servant. The first character of a righteous servant is, وَعِبَادُ الرَّحْمَانِ الَّذِينَ يَمْشُونَ عَلَى الْأَرْضِ هَوْنَا وَإِذَا خَاطَبَهُمُ الْجَاهِلُونَ قَالُوا سَلَامًا That we should be humble. The Prophet ﷺ says, إِنَّ اللَّهَ أَوْحَى إِلَيَّ أَن تَوَاضْعُوا حَتَّى لَا يَفْخُرَ أَحَدٌ عَلَى أَحَدٌ That I was commanded to tell all of you to just humble yourselves. Do not put yourself above anyone else under any circumstances whatsoever. Uh, by race, by gender, by anything. Do not put yourself above anyone else. Put yourself where it is. Abdullah and Mukhti, inshallah, at Ta'ib, al Raja ila Rabbihi. This is what we need to do. We're all mistaken people with shortcomings, flaws, defects, and weaknesses. We need to be the humble one that's just trying to fix my situation. And if we're going to advise somebody else, not because I know better than you and I'm superior to you, it's just because there's something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blessed us from in the scripture that I know is in our best interest. If we embrace it. And so the Prophet وسلم, a man came to him and he says, Wallahi ana uhibbu an yakuna thawbi wa na'li hasana. Ayakunu dhalika min al-kibr. He asked the Prophet وسلم, I like to have nice clothes. I like to have a nice outfit and some nice shoes on. Is that arrogant? And the Prophet وسلم, says, Inna Allah jameelun yuhibbu al-jamal. Al-kibru batar al-haq wa ghamt al-nas. He said, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is beautiful by nature. So if you want to look beautiful and nice, that's fine. Okay, he loves these things. The kibr, the arrogance, is batr al-haq. To not accept the truth when it's brought to you. To want your opinion to be the best, rather than honestly trying to understand the one that explaining to you something that differs with you, seeing that maybe there's truth in that, right? So to reject something out from the get-go because I'm right and you're wrong no matter what. Whatever you said that this is that has to be wrong because I'm right and you're wrong from the get-go. That attitude is arrogant. Seeing the ghamtun nas, seeing oneself superior to others, looking down on other people for any reason, right? Somebody said to me once, okay, but you're leaving that open, Sheikh. And I said, what do you mean? He said, what about the disbelievers? How do you know that one you're looking down to is not going to become a great Muslim after you higher and better and superior than you? As Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu anhu, people that may have been looking down upon him when he was in his jahiliyyah and then he became al-Faruq, al-Amir al-Mu'mineen. You don't know the futures of people. Work on our own futures and then we advise others. We have a sincere, merciful, compassionate desire for them to be better because of the revelation. Not because it's our understanding of the revelation, but just because that's what we see in the revelation that's in our best benefit. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to guide us and strengthen us and help us in our way to the truth in Jannah. Bismillah walhamdulillah wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. We're all in a situation where we have a lot of difficulties, we have things that we have to take care of, responsibilities and struggles in life. That's normal. And yes, Islam allows us to take some relaxation, take some off time here and there as the exception to the norm and take some sort of time off. That's fine. Right? But at the end of the day, in Allah yuhibbu al-ma'al al-umur wa ashrafaha. Okay, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He loves the high-mindedness, the, the high standards of hoping to be the greatest in this life and the hereafter according to Islam and following the Qur'an and the Sunnah. And so the Qur'an says, وَمَنْ أَرَادَ الْآخِرَةَ وَسَعَى لَهَا سَعْيَهَا وَهُوَ مُؤْمِنْ فَأُولَٰئِكَ كَانَ سَعْيُهُمْ مَشْكُورًا So if you want to go to heaven, and you want to get that diploma of Jannah, the absolute relaxation time, the great time that now you have no rules, no haram, there's no ibadat that you have to do. Jannah, there's nothing. You've proven yourself. Your loyalty, your gratitude, your love to your Creator through this simple small life has been established, right? That's when we 
put our guard down and we know we get what we want. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that we take our lives seriously and that we choose our lifestyle and our friends and what we want to do with our lives because of some guidance that He has blessed us. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive us for being lazy and weak and coming up short and heedless. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us understanding of His deen so that we can properly practice, present and teach it to others. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us a people who are unified for our cause, helping to promote His message amongst mankind with each other, seeing all of the great things that we agree on and what enrich us in our diversity and not allowing any of the differences and uh, different realities to cause us to feel at odds with each other. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless our brothers and sisters who are going through amazing trials and tribulations and we ask them to be patient and their sins to be forgiven and those that are killed and murdered in their oppression that they become uh, true martyrs in his sake going straight to Jannah for the patience that they have put forth. الله أكبر الله أكبر أشهد أن لا